kind of the future and kind of, you know, precision oncology, I guess is the theme of this year's ASCO, mm -hmm. you know, of JCO last week, medicine, precision yeah. medicine. Right. So, I mean, would anybody consider, I mean, A, we really don't have good biomarkers for carbo, and we have ERCC, but that's not that great. Yeah. You know, so would anybody consider doing genomic assays in triple negative breast cancer to look for targets that? Well, the HRD score will be coming out. Melinda Telly's work from SABCS <laughs> last year, the myriad, the homologous recombination deficiency score on paraffin, looking at re, number of regions of LOH, not amplicons, because apparently they're transient sometimes, but the LOH lesions are stable, and um, benchmarking it off of a BRCA1 breast cancer, so eight, high HRD above 10, you know, tracking with BRCA1s. Nice, you know, she had a nice response with preoperative gem carbo, 80 patients or so, PAF CR rate, 50, 55%. 50% with Jim It was Carter, pretty, though. it was a high pap There are a lot of BRCA1 patients. A lot of BRCA1 patients. Neoadjuvant. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But then um, higher uh, pap CR rate in the HRD positive, lower pap CR. You know, and I think there may be some um, discussion in the cooperative groups about potentially uh, looking I at that HRD prospectively. I think HRD is going to be looked at in, uh, in additional trials. I mean, that we don't know yet, though. I mean, I think generally there's still. Um, a lot of questions oh, yeah. about where yeah, there's only now. a small data. Set so so I, far. I, I think what I think what you're asking, Adam, is are are we ready to do gene sequencing to choose first line therapy for metastatic breast right. cancer to yeah. to guide therapy I to find actionable no. information? Right. Would you? And I would say I, no. It's not I, part my of my own, standard. I mean, I don't know what other people right. think. But right. what about doing it to get to think about you know? Because this woman obviously is not going to do well. And so you have to think, you know, three, four, five lines down the road, whatever, five months down the road. It's going to say she has a PI3 kinase mutation Correct. and a P10 deletion. I mean, it is really interesting that, you know, you send off these tests to, right. and that's what you get back. I mean, and then Correct. you get a whole bunch of other things that tell you you should put them on drugs which aren't available. So it is, I think it's a really interesting idea, but we have to be very careful in what we're telling our patients to expect. Absolutely. But as everybody knows, there's it. a foundation of medicine. We'll have an abstract tomorrow. Um, about metastatic breast cancer and the fact that 80% of people apparently have a have an actual mutation when they do exome sequencing, at least targeted exome sequencing. So I don't know because our patients are going to find out about this. They're going to want to know. You know, obviously people are going to hear this talk, docs, whenever this comes out. You know, three, four, or five months from now. You know, and their people are going to ask. So what what do we do? I think the only actionable mutations we have are BRCA1 and 2 with PARP data that's coming out, PARP inhibition data that's coming out. And I, I've been involved with the uh, Biomarin 673 um, phase 1 study at our institutions. Ev Weinberg is leading it and of two, you know, we've, we're just seeing terrific responses in patients who are BRCA carriers with single agent PARP inhibition. And I think that's where our hope is, but it's not enough patients that qualify for that. What about somatic BRCA mutations? What yeah. about not germline, but somatic? Uh, I think that the companies that are developing these agents are quite gun shy based yeah. on the negative Iniparib results. And was so, the ever, them, was, were, did everybody look at BRCA expression? Even though there weren't BRCA mutations looking in the Well, it didn't in inhibit the PARP in it. Right. It does. <laughs> it yeah, right, I know. <laughs> yeah. Small problem. Exactly. Yeah. Anyway. Well, yeah. go ahead. I mean, I mean, uh, what a situation for this, uh, this patient. Uh, there are some options there based on rather limited um, amounts of data. The agents approved by the FDA would include gibcitabine. Uh, because of the tumor being triple negative, then you would think, oh, perhaps uh, we'll go with a ribulin instead of uh, capecitabine. Or exabepilone cap uh, uh, and, and then there's the combination of uh, exabepilone in combination with capecitabine, uh, which is very modestly used because of the toxicity of exabepilone in terms of neuropathy that we have not been able to over overcome. But it's still approved by the FDA, although not approved in other parts this of, of the, the world. This is about the only scenario that I've ever used the double it in, yeah. this yes. exact scenario. Exactly. How about yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. paclitaxel bevacizumab? Because you would have been, uh, uh, you were going to say that, because you would have uh, been eligible could, for E2100. Absolutely. We should have also yes. ended on, we should yeah. end on Hope's uh, e yes. Salo GV study. I mean, yeah, you know, even though that's we, first line. Everybody got bevacizumab in that trial, as yeah. you know, and I, right. there was, <laughs> that really was looking at the different ta uh, microtubule inhibitors. and weekly exabepilone as opposed to the way it's FDA approved, which is every three weeks, that was clearly inferior. But uh, we looked at a high-dose NAB paclitaxel and then standard 
weekly paclitaxel with bevacizumab, and they were uh, relatively equivalent. It's just that if you go up on the doses of nab paclitaxel to 150 per meter squared, the toxicity isn't tolerable for the patient. So, uh, but uh, weekly paclitaxel seemed to be the best tolerated, and the similar in efficacy. Who, we had who a discovered that. <laughs> Andy Seidman published that in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. The, uh, the, and, and that's what the study I did circle. was based on. And we just came right back there again. The end of but, you know, full we circle. Did, we did look at the triple negative subset as an unplanned subset analysis, and we still need uh, Dan updated data on that. But, uh, but you know, the, certainly they were more equivalent in the triple negative group. And because of that data in part, uh, there's been a lot of interest on the part of Celgene in exploring nab paclitaxel and triple negative breast cancer. So there's a number of different investigative studies going on, neoadjuvant and metastatic. So we'll see what that shows. So again, you know, you started out when we were talking about aribulin. These are chemotherapy drugs, not targeted agents. So we'll see. <laughs> so anyway, I just want to say.